He screamed. The fat one behind me, he swung. I ducked. He tripped. He fell. I jumped. The last man was a boy. He cried. He was too shaken to beg for his life. I told him to be a man in the next life or he's less than a worm in this one and flung the knife right in his neck. His blood hit the floor before his knees. I let the half-blind man live because we need stories in order to live, don't we, priest? Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to welcome you to this evening's event with Marlon James, discussing his new fantasy epic, the first installation in the Dark Star trilogy, Black Leopard, Red Wolf. With this book, Marlon James has written something chillingly original that squashes any fantasy tropes. In the book's 80 plus characters, there are demons who whisper the fears of your heart, mournful giants, and perspective buffaloes. It is jarring, metaphysical, and exceptional. We are so pleased to host him here in Harvard Square tonight. Please join me in welcoming Marlon James. Wow. You know, yesterday I was, I was t talking to somebody about um, my first reading where only one person showed up. And that person showed up because somebody was trying to set her up with me. <laughs> and I was like, somebody didn't read the memo. <laughs> <laughs> that was a wonderful time in Seattle. Actually, that no, was very awkward. <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming out. And thanks to Kate for that, that wonderful introduction. Because I, I teach, I still feel very suspicious of people out on a school night. <laughs> Even though I realize some of you might not be in school, I still can't let go of it. I'm like, and I have to stop myself. Oh my God, y'all came out on a school night. As long as you're not doing my paper later. Um, so we're gonna, um, I'm gonna read from, from this novel a little bit, but I also wanna talk about it and talk about how it came about and how that dogged African Game of Thrones thing <laughs> keeps get thrown around. You know, the truth is, you know, um, I was trying to find a kind of narrative shorthand to describe it. And, um, and I was figuring, you know, it was a magazine I was interviewing me. I figured nobody reads this magazine. <laughs> and so I said, yeah, it's like an African Game of Thrones. And I didn't know that, you know, very few people read this magazine, but everybody who reads it works in media. <laughs> so then it all, you know, it took off and to the point where George R.R. R. Martin emails me. <laughs> no, I will not give you his email address. <laughs> and no, I have no idea what's going on with Winds of Winter, <laughs> in case you want to know. Um, but he was delighted. He was even offered, he even offered um, you know, research help which I did not take because I'm a moron. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's the, the, the one thing I'd say, and, and I think the reason why I reached for that, that um, the African Game of Thrones so quickly was one of the things I like about that, sh that, that uh, book and, and, and to a lesser extent a TV show is that he, is that he, refuses to let go of the world of make-believe, even when telling a very adult story. And I think there is a kind of way we look at the West, particularly with our literature, that it's a sign of maturity that we let go of make-believe. It's a sign of maturity when we let go of the fantastical, um, to the point where we sort of have, we sort of place um, a sort of social realism as literature evolved. And social realism is as much a construct as everywhere else. I've never seen so many books with no black people in them <laughs> as, as social realists, as social, you know, realist novels. And, um, you know, one of the things I was, and I'm not trying to diss social realism because I like, I, 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 I like all fabulism and it's as fabulous as all the rest. Um, but I never accepted this idea that I was supposed to outgrow um, those creatures that go bump in the dark, um, and that the 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 fantastical 
or the surreal was something that um, that was we should leave in, behind in literature. So when the first time I read Gabriel Garcia Marquez, it was a huge revelation to me. Um, it was a huge reaffirming for me as well. Same thing, same as the first time I read Toni Morrison, Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. If you haven't read it, I don't know what's wrong with you. Um, yeah, I talk about how the I read the last, say, t the last 30 pages of Song of Solomon standing up because I couldn't believe anybody could be this brilliant. And I remember just turning each page going, this book is going to crash and burn here. No, here, no. And those of you who know the ending of that, of that um, novel, I was on a balcony when I read the end. That person read the book. <laughs> So that was exactly what it be. I, I was so convinced I was going to fly. I did not. <laughs> um, but just, you know, the, the, again, it was this sort of um, realizing that the, these things, the, 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 the sort of the, the supernatural, the unseen, the whatever things um, are very much real and very much um, part, with, um, part um, you know, still with us. Um, the other thing that gets thrown around a lot with this novel is Lord of the Rings. And one, because I'm a huge fan of Lord of the Rings. In fact, I was such a fan of Lord of the, Lord of the Rings, I had to run a spell check in this novel to, to take out all the parts I was ripping off. <laughs> um, and I think there's still more in there. I think there's a line in it where somebody was talking about they got too greedy and dug too deep. I'm like, oh my God, Helm's Deep. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get rid of, of, of all of it. But the... the, the the, 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 the Lord of the Rings, or The Hobbit rather, came up again, came up because of the origin of this novel. It was a, you know, a fight I had with my friend that was after they um, announced the casting, the cast for The Hobbit. And I was like, oh Lord, here we go again. I was like, I'm going to argue about diversity and inclusion. You're going to talk about it's a European story. And so, of course, we had that argument about diversity and inclusion. And I was like, you know... If somebody opened, if this film opened and, and, and we're in the Shire and there's an Asian hobbit, nobody would care. Nobody would have cared. And my friend was like, well, you know, Lord of the Rings is a British story and it's reflecting British culture and, um, and, it's Scandin and Norse culture and so on. And I said, you know, Lord of the Rings isn't real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... it's you can do what you want with it. <laughs> and I said, you know what? Keep your damn hobbit. Um, and what, what happened, the, the thing is, the, the, it's, before I even thought I was going to write this novel, I went on a mission to read. So I went and, 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 and tried to discover and rediscover all these myths and legends. Some I might have heard of, most I haven't. And there's a reason behind that as well. I think we have a way of thinking particularly, you know, you know, those of us who come from Africa or come are descendant from the continent, that ground zero for us is slavery, which is ridiculous. And I should know, I wrote a novel about slavery. Um, but it says something that it, for me at least, it took an act of research to come back to our myths. Myths are important, legends are important. Um, Margaret Atwood said, human nature has not changed in a thousand years. You know by checking the myths. I didn't have myths to check. And I realized how rootless um, that was and how I felt. So before I even thought of writing, I was, only I was only reading. But the thing about writing for me is every now and then you come across that story, that book that makes you want to write books. Um, it remembers the first time, you know, I read Jessica Hagedon's Dog Eaters or Salman Rushdie's Shame or Toni Morrison's Sula, the type of books that made me go, I want to write something. Um, or even Cormac McCarthy. Um, the problem sometimes is that you start to write like these authors, and my Cormac McCarthy phase was awful. <laughs> you know, my Cormac McCarthy phase would be like, it would be like, he looked at the bottle of water, and he stared at the bottle of water, and he grabbed the bottle of water, and he drank a bottle of water. <laughs> Don't act like you know except the front car McCarthy, but he would never tolerate that shit from me. <laughs> um, 
So I'm going to read some sections and, and talk about them a little bit. And then I want to open up for questions and signings and, and so on. Um, there are a bunch of proverbs um, that sort of spread all over the book in different languages. And the first one that appears says, Biojuri enu apamo, which means not everything the eye sees should be spoken by the mouth. Which is funny since this entire book is an eyewitness testimony. <laughs> As being ironic, laugh. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the child is dead. There is nothing left to know. I hear there is a queen in the south who kills the man who brings her bad news. So when I give word of the boy's death, do I write my own death with it? Truth eats lies just as a crocodile eats the moon. And yet my witness is the same today as it will be tomorrow. No, I did not kill him, though I may have wanted him dead. Crave for it the way a glutton craves goat flesh. Oh, to draw a bow and fire it through his black heart and watch it explode black blood, and to watch his eyes for when they stop blinking, when they look but stop seeing, and to listen for his voice croaking, and hear his chest heave in a death rattle, saying, look, my wretched spirit leaves this most wretched of bodies, and to smile at such tidings and dance at such a loss. Yes, I glut at the conceit of it, but no, I did not kill him. Be your Jew, re pamo. Not everything that I see should be spoken by the mouth. This cell is larger than the one before. I smell the dried blood of executed men. I hear their ghosts still screaming. Your bread carries weevils, and your water carries the piss of ten guards, ten and two guards, and the goat they fuck for sport. Shall I give you a story? I am just a man who some have called a wolf. The child is dead. I know the woman brings you different news. Call him murderer, she says, even though my only sorrow is that I did not kill her. The red-headed one said, the child's head was infested with devils. If you believe in devils, I believe in bad blood. You look like a man who has never shed blood, and yet blood sticks between your fingers. A boy you circumcised, a young girl too small for your big. Look how that thrills you. Look at you. I will give you a story. It begins with a leopard and a witch, grand inquisitor, fetish priest. No, you will not call for the guards. My mouth may say too much before they club it shut. Regard yourself. A man with 200 cows who delights in a patch of boy skin and the coo of a girl who should be no man's woman. Because that is what you seek, is it not? A dark little thing that cannot be found in 30 sacks of gold or 200 cows or 200 wives. Something that you have lost. No, it was taken from you. That light, you see it and you want it. Not light from the sun or from the thunder god in the night sky, but light with no blemish. Light in a boy with no knowledge of woman. A girl you bought for marriage, not because you need a wife, for you have 200 cows. But a wife you can tear open because you search for it in holes, black holes, wet holes, underground holes for the light that vampires look for. And you will have it. You will dress it up in ceremony, circumcision for the boy, consummation for the girl. And when they shed blood and spit and sperm and piss, you leave it all on your skin to go into the Iroka tree and use any hole you find. The child is dead. And so is everyone. I walk for days through swarms of flies in the blood swamp and skin slicing rocks in the salt plains through day and night. I walked as far south as Omororo and did not know or care. Men detained me as a beggar, took me for a thief, tortured me as a traitor, and when news of the dead child reached your kingdom, arrested me as a murderer. Did you know there were five men in my cell? Four nights ago, the scarf around my neck belongs to the only man left on two feet. He might even seize from his right eye again one day. The other four... Make record as I have said it. Old men say, night is a fool. It will not judge, but whatever comes, it will not warn. The first came from my bed. I woke up to my own death rattle, and it was a man crushing my throat. 
shorter than an ogre but taller than a horse, smelled like he butchered a goat, grabbed me by the neck and hoisted me in the air while the other men kept quiet. I tried to pull his fingers but a, de but a devil was in his grip. Kicking his chest was kicking stone. He held me up as if admiring a precious jewel. I kneed him in the jaw so hard he sliced his tongue. He dropped me and I charged for his balls like a bull. He fell, I grabbed his knife, razor sharp, and cut his throat. The second grabbed for my arms, but I was naked and slippery. The knife, my knife, I rammed it between his ribs. The third danced with his feet and fists like a nightfly, whistling like a mosquito, make a fist I did, then stuck two fingers out like rabbit ears. Jabbed his left eye in the quick and pulled the whole thing out. Sorry. <laughs> he screamed. The fat one behind me, he swung. I ducked. He tripped. He fell. I jumped. The last man was a boy. He cried. He was too shaken to beg for his life. I told him to be a man in the next life or he's less than a worm in this one and flung the knife right in his neck. His blood hit the floor before his knees. I let the half-blind man live because we need stories in order to live, don't we, priest? Inquisitor, I don't know what to call you. But these are not your men. Good. Then you have no debt song to sing to their widows. You have come for story, and I have moved to talk, so the gods have smiled on both of us. I swear the next section won't be as violent. <laughs> so... I'm jumping all over so that you don't end up with such a view of the book that you don't need to buy it. <laughs> so in, in, this, in this story, there's a character, her name is Sogalon, also known as the Moon Witch. And she talks about um, her life with a princess. And the princess lives in a fort that, um, that's only a fort there where only women live. But they're, uh, but they're also imprisoned. And um, in a lot of cultures, particularly in ancient Ethiopia, what a king would do is immediately banish any pretenders to the throne to one of these mountain fortresses. Um, they're hugely lavish. Most times they're so remote you can only get there by a strap that you climb up. And usually it's, if I become king, suddenly my four brothers need to be banished. Or sisters. So this is a this is um but this is a a, a, a very quick scene where Sogolon talks about how a fortress of only women manage a conjugal visit. That means there is sex in, <laughs> in there. Sorry. <laughs> and this is in Sogolon's voice, not the narrator's. Let us make this quick. The water goddess see all and know all. I am a priestess serving in the temple in Wakadishu when I go down the steps that lead to the river and up jump Bunshi. No fear come from me, though I see she have a fishtail black like pitch. She sent me to Mantha with nothing but my leather dress, one sandal, and a mark from the house at Wakadishu. The princess, Lissi Solo, take to her room and play the chora at sunset and talk to no one. In the divine sisterhood, no one have power or class or rank, so her royal blood don't mean nothing. But all the sisters see her need to be alone. Word was that she walked the lands at night on the moonlight to whisper to the goddess of justice and girl children how much she hate her. After a year, I walked to the sacred hall to pour libations. She pointed at me and said, what is your use? To bring it into your royal purpose, princess. Nothing about my purpose is royal, and I am no princess, she say. Two moons, and she moved me to her side, woman as equal, but knowing she is royal. Two moons after that, I telling her that the water goddess have greater purpose for her. Three moons more, and she believed me, after I someone due to lift me off the ground and above her head. No, not believe me, she believed that something more be to her life than a childless widow saying prayers to a goddess she hate. Not my belief, for she said, belief will get people around her killed. I said to her, no, my mistress, only believe in love, do that. Accept it, return it, cherish it, but never believe love can do anything other than love. 
The year didn't finish before Bunji appeared to her on the last hot night of the year, when nearly all the women, 129, went to bathe in the waterfall with nymphs, to tell her the truth about her line and why she will be the one to restore it. We will send a man. It has all been arranged, Bunji said. Look at my life. All of it around a hole, owned, ordered, and arranged by men. Now I must make you take that from woman. Now I must take that from womankind too. You know nothing of sisterhood. You're just a pale echo of men. The true king will be a bastard. Did this water sprite also fall on her head at birth? No, your most excellent. We have found a prince in Kalendar. Another one. They seem to be everywhere, like head lice. These kingdomless princes of Kalendar. A marriage to a prince make your child legitimate. And when the true line of king returns, he can claim before all lords. Fuck all lords. All these kings also come from the womb of woman. What is to stop this man child from doing just as all other man has done? Kill all men. Then rule them, princess. Rule them through him and leave this place. What if I like this place? In Fasisi, even the winds conspire against you. If it is your wish to stay, then stay, mistress. But as long as your brother is king, plagues above the earth and below will visit even this place. No plague has visited me so far. What is it? When is this pestilence taking place? Why not now? Maybe the gods give you time to prevent it, your excellence. Your tongue is too smooth. I do not fully trust it. Let me see this man at least. He will come to you disguised as a eunuch. If he pleases you, then we will find an elder who cares for our cause. An elder? So we're doomed to be betrayed then, she say. No, mistress, I say. I brought the prince from Kalendar. No man put down foot in Mantha for 100 years, but many eunuchs. None of the women would ask the eunuch to lift his robes, for the scars show horrendous knife craft. But at the great entrance stand the big guard, daughter from the line of the tallest woman in Fasisi, who grab the crotch and squeeze. Before I tell this prince, this is what you do. Forget your great discomfort and do not betray your unease or they will kill you at the gate and not care if they kill a prince. Take your balls and feel for each, then push them out of the sack into your bush. Take your kong kong and pull it hard between your legs until it touch near your bottom hole. The guard will feel your ball skin hanging on both sides of the Kong Kong and think you're a woman. She will not even look at your face. This prince made it all the way to Lissisola chamber before he removed veil and robe. Tall, dark, thick in hair, brown in eyes, thick and dark in the lips, patterned scars above the brows and down both arms, and many years younger in age. All he know was that this is a crown princess and he will see title. Hmm. He'll do. Mrs. Solo say, you didn't think that reading was going to go in that direction, did you? <laughs> and in a church. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read one more section, talk about it a little bit, and then I'm going to go into some questions. Let's see if I can find, there it is. This section also begins with a proverb. It says, Ingasi ana garkusa ura adan garkusa inshamuni. If he hides fire, he cannot hide its smoke. And this is um, my, two, my two earnest heroes get caught in a ceremony in a city called Congor while they're trying to figure out what happened to a man who was murdered. And the ceremony is called Bingingun. Bingingun. This is what I learned from the Kongori and why they hate nakedness. To wear only skin is to wear the mind of a child, the mind of the mad, or even the mind of the man with no role in society, even lower than usurers and trinket sellers, for even such as they have their use. Bingingun is how the people of the north set a place for the dead among the living. Bingingun is the masquerade, drummers and dancers and singers of great oriki. They wear the asoake, the asoake cloth underneath, and the cloth is white with indigo stripes and looks like that which we clothe the dead. They wear net on their face and hands, for now there will be masquerade, not men with names. 
When the Bingingun spins and make a whirlwind, the ancestors possess them. They jump as high as roofs. He who makes the costume is an Amewa, a knower of beauty. For if you know the Kangori, they view everything through the eye of what is beautiful. Not ugly, for that has no value, especially ugliness of character. And not too beautiful, for that is merely a skeleton in disguise. Bin Gingun is made from the best of fabrics, red and pink and gold and blue and silver, all trimmed in cowries and coins, for there is power in the beauty, in patterns and braids, sequins and tassels, in amulets with medicine. Bin Gingun in dance, Bin Gingun in march, make for transformation into the ancestors. All this I learn on my travels, for Juba has masquerade, but they are not Bin Gingun. I said all this to the Ogo because we followed a procession on the way to the house so that a man as tall as he would not look strange in torchlight. He still looked strange. Five drummers in front setting the dance, three beating barrel drums, a fourth beating a double skin batter, and the fifth beating four small batter tied around to make a sound pitched high like a crow call. Following the drummers came the Binging Gun, among them the Ancestor King in royal robes and a cowrie shell, and the trickster whose robes turn inside out and not to another robe, and yet another robe, as the Binging Gun all swirled and stomped to the drum. Ten and five of this clan shuffled to the left and stomped, then shuffled to the right and hopped. I said all this to the Ogo so he would not start talking again about whom he killed with his hands and how there is nothing in this world, or next like or nothing like the sound of a crushing skull. Sadago's face was lost in the dark, and he, stood stall, and he stood taller than the torches. He waved his hands in the air with the binging gun, marched when they marched, and stopped when they stopped. Here is truth. I did not know which house was Fumanguru's, other than that it was in the Tarobi quarter, north of the Nimbe boundary, and that, is all, that it would almost be hidden by massive growths of thornbush. I said, let us look. Outside the fourth house, Sadago grabbed a torch from the wall. At the ninth house, I smelled it, the fire stink of sulfur, still fresh in the scent after so many years. Most of the houses on this street stacked themselves tight beside each other, but this stood apart, now an island of thornbush, larger than the other houses for how it looked in the dark. The bush had grown wide and tall, reaching way to the front door. We went around the back. We stood in the courtyard right beside the grain keep with millet and sorghum gone sour from getting wet from many rains, caked with rat shit and fresh with rat pups. The house, a cluster of dwellings, five points like a star. Not what I expected to see in Congor, but Fumanguru was no Congori. Salago placed the torch in the dirt and lifted up the whole courtyard. Spoiled meat, fresh shit, dead dog, I can't tell, the ogre said. All three perhaps, I said. I pointed to the first dwelling on the right. Salago nodded and followed. The first dwelling told me how I would find the rest. Everything left the way, Omaluzu left it. Stools broken, jars crushed, tapestry, tapestry ripped down, rugs and clothes thrown out. I grabbed a blanket. Hidden in the smell of the dirt and rain, two boys, the youngest perhaps, but the smell went as far as the wall and died. All dead people smell the same, but sometimes their living smell can take you to the point where they died. Sadago, how do the Kongori bury their dead? Not in earth, in urns too big for this room. If they had a choice, Fumanguru's family might have been dumped somewhere, appalling the gods. Maybe burnt? Not the Kongori, he said. They believe burning a body frees into the air whatever killed him. How do you know? have killed a few. This is how it went. I, not now, Sadago. We went to the next room, which, judging by the Mojave wood bed, must have been Fumanguru's. His wall, all scenes, hunting mostly, carved into wood. I wondered if, unlike the others who had been here, whoever came before us found what they are looking for. Word was that Basu Fumanguru wrote many writs against the king, 20 or 30 articles in total, some with testimony to his wrongdoing. There was a man I know who had wor I had words with. He said people search for the writs, and that is why he was killed. But what little I know of Fumanguru tell me he's no fool, and surely he would wish his words to not die with him. 
the rich are not here? No. Not only that, Godogo, but I don't think that what people are, that's what people are looking for. Remember the boy? Buncha said she saved him. I'm going to move that one. So they find a piece of cloth in the house, and the cloth sends off. If you don't know, the tracker is a, so tracker has a, a nose, and it says throughout the book, it's been said you have a nose. And usually once he smells something belonging to you, he can track you wherever you are, no matter where in the world. So he opens one of these urns, and there's a dead child in it, but the, 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 the cloth he's clutching is not the kid's, not the child's. It says, I looked up just as the ogre wiped a tear from his cheek. He was thinking of killed children, but not this one. What is he holding, I asked. Parchment, a piece of clay. I grabbed it. Cloth, simple as asaoke fabric, but not. I pulled at it, but the boy would not let go. He died with this, his last show of defiance, the poor, brave child. I halted the thought before it went further. One more pull and it was free, a piece of blue cloth torn from something bigger. The boy was wrapped in white. I put the cloth to my nose, and one year of sun, night, thunder and rain, hundreds of days of walks, dozens of hills, valleys, sands, seas, houses, cities, plains, smell so strong it became sight, and hearing, and touch, and I could reach out and touch the boy, grab him in my mind and reel from him being so far away, too far away, my head rushing and jumping and sinking below the sea, then flying higher and higher and higher and smelling air, free of smoke, smell pushing me, pulling me, dragging me through jungles, tunnels, birds, ripped flesh, flesh eater insects, shit, piss and blood, blood rushed into me, so much blood my eyes went red, then black. So gone, I thought you would never return, Sadogo said. I rolled on my side and sat up. How long? Not long, but you were deep like in sleep. Your eyes were milk white. I thought demons were in your head, but no froth came to your mouth. It only happens when I'm not expecting it. I smell something and someone's life comes to me all in a rush. It's a madness, even when I know I've learned even when I've learned how to master it. But Ogo, there is something. Another dead body? No, the boy. He looked in the urn. No, the boy we seek. He's alive. And I know where he is. I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you. So I'm going to open it up for questions. I think there's a mic right there so you could come up. Because if you shout, then I have to repeat the question. And this brave soul has come first. <laughs> uh, How's it going? Uh, going good. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll see if I'm good at asking questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, in growing up, it always seemed to me as, you know, reading about as a white human being, mm -hmm. uh, it was really easy to read about uh, this, uh, another world, like Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. and so forth, and to imagine myself in them. Right. And so, of course, with Africa, you have this rich history of literature that has come out of it and as well as that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it has been really dark. And with your book, uh, it seems that it's kind of strays away from that in a way, in a more fiction way, and it sort of normalizes uh, the uh, idea of having black characters in a book. You know, just mm -hmm. uh, how, do, how does it feel to, and maybe I'm wrong in, the, in this uh, this assumption or mm -hmm. this idea, but um, to have like this world that surrounds uh, black culture and black history mm -hmm. um, that kind of normalizes it and that maybe stands us along the side of like Lord of the Rings and so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, like you said, George R. R. Martin's uh, yeah. Game of Thrones and so forth. Um, well, the first thing is I wasn't necessarily thinking of all that when I was writing it. Um, I know, I know, you know, I believe what Tony Morrison says that you should write the books you want to read. And I, and I read books. I mean, I write books the way I, I you know, I would read them. And, um, I, I, perp, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, underplay how much of this I did because it was fun. Yeah. Um, and how much I did because I get, you know, I, I, I still want, I want swords and I want sorcery. 
and I want witches and I want fairies and I want mermaids. <laughs> and if you know me, I also want lust of shedding of blood. Um, <laughs> and so I don't want to, to, to let go of that, that a lot of it was for the sheer enjoyment. Um, but also a lot of it for me was personally affirming because I think for a lot of us, even when we're not necessarily church goers, we're in a lot of ways non-worshipping Christians. And if we're not non-worshipping Christians, we're most certainly Calvinists. Um, yeah. And so it, it, what, for me, and I can only speak for myself, a lot of it was me kind of um, not necessarily getting rid of the Western or, and all that, because I grew up with that and I love it, but to... Um, to switch to, 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 to delve into myth and pull from it the same way a Tolkien would have pulled from, say, Norse, Norse mythology. And I wanted that. I wanted, this, I wanted to go into a sort of a different reservoir of ideas and with it a different value system and with a different idea of, of, of even good and evil. Um, a couple of things that were very different from, from the, 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 the myths and the legends and the fantasies I read is I think a lot of the Western fantasies there is clearly defined evil and clearly define good. You know, Frodo good, Sauron evil, which is fine. Um, in a lot of African stories, it's not so clearly defined. Um, in a lot of African stories, the trickster either tells a story, tells a story or is a protagonist. Um, so that, that um, completely changes, for example, how you respond to narrative. If you know that, I might be tricking you. Um, what I said to people so far is, I know some of you have, you know, developed some deep emotional attachment to some of these characters. You might want to rethink that, <laughs> <laughs> um, because they mean they're definitely not going to appear like that in the next in the next book. But yeah, I I I, I mean, I mostly did it for fun, but I also wanted to. I really wanted to see what it feel what it was like, and that was and, and it was answered in writing this book what it is to pull from myths that are from my own origin, which is something I, I, I you know I haven't done. I don't necessarily say it has to be done. One of my absolute favorite writers in the world is Helen Oyeyemi, and one of the most radical things about her is how she draws from Western mythologies all the time and stories like Boy Snowbird couldn't have happened without Snow White, and it's all the better for it. Um, one thing I will say is, is when you go back and research all the epics, you realize how similar they are. You know, all of them with their flood myths and with the giant serpent eating its tail and fairies and so on. Um, it, 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 if anything, it makes me again wonder um, if the world ended up being kind of poorer because we let all those fairies and, and witches and goblins go. Well, the goblins can go, but the others can stay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Marlon. Uh, Hi. I wanted to congratulate you on the Booker Prize uh, that you won. And also Thank you. say that um, The Brief History of Seven Killings is perhaps mm. the most affecting book I have read in, in over a decade. He says as he clutches my new book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I normally read very elegant British literature and, you know, um, with the, without any patois in it. Uh -huh. But it was, it was so out of my, uh, my comfort zone. But I really, really immersed myself mm -hmm. in your book and enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, the only thing I want to ask you is, as, mm. as a gay man, as mm. a batty man, as your book would say, <laughs> uh, I felt very repulsed by this constant reference to the bombo cloth in it. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask, what is this fixation in uh, Jamaican profanity mm. with female sanitary products? That is a very, you know... <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, though. Because yeah, because even even rass cloth is just a modification of your ass cloth, which a lot of Jamaicans actually don't know. Um, it's funny because I almost spelt it the way Jamaicans spelt it, and I realized nobody would get that all of these bad words are related to female body function, and I. Unfortunately, I can't say where they originated from, although I know they go way, way, way back. I've always considered it really, really curious, um, but nobody can tell me. I say, what's up with all our, what's up with all the, our, our expletives being concerned with female body function? I mean, patriarchy, yes, but I mean, where did it come from and why is it still considered? I don't know if it's still considered just the height of an insult to throw um, you know, a bloody cloth at somebody. You know, and I say, you know, your blood clot or your ass clot. 
I won't say the rest. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's it's. I will say though, I, I think they do. I think they have moved though to the point where where people have forgot the original meanings of them and just use them. I mean, and I you know I have a very I love expletives. I love bad words. I love I, when people say things like. You know, expletives are a sign of ignorance. I'm like, you clearly have never read Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think expletives are language spice. Sometimes a little too hot, but sometimes just right. <laughs> and that is the smartest answer I can give you. <laughs> Thank you. How are you doing? Blood seed. What? <laughs> hey, the Jamaicans just come out. <laughs> and they're all cussing. <laughs> So proud of your work from Jamaica. Thank you. Just amazing. Thank my, you. my question is a technique question. Mm -hmm. You create so many different voices. Right. And most writers, when they have two voices, they kind of sometimes sound the same. Mm -hmm. All of yours sound different. Mm -hmm. How do you do that and how do you keep track of so many different voices? I'm nearly going mad. Um, how do I do that? I. Um, for one, voice is important to me and dialogue is important to me. And, and even when I'm teaching dialogue, I spend a good two weeks on it with my students. They're, they're usually annoyed. Like one of the exercises I give them, I have them read a, a passage of very bad dialogue. And they know it's bad. I'm like, yeah, you're, you're not dumb people. You know it's bad. Um, I, but I say, but there are 28 things wrong with it. You have the whole weekend to find, figure it out. Usually they come up with four. Um, cause it's, it's, this is one of the reasons also why I don't believe in the myth of the reclusive author. Everybody thinks Thomas Pynchon is a recluse. He's not a recluse. He goes to that bar on 59th street. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, he's just not into the, he's just not into the, into the book bullshit, but he is not a recluse. And the reason why I say that is you cannot be locked off by myself and write great dialogue. I'm not saying you have to be around people, but you have to be interested in people. And I'm always interested in people. I'm interested in how people talk and how what they don't say. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, most people try to not not to be near a fight. I run to a fight. Oh my God! So the last time I ran to a fight, <laughs> it was it was my next door neighbor, and I did the whole glass to the wall thing because I'm like I'm gonna get some dialogue tonight. <laughs> And the guy says, you know what? I'm going to take a trip to planet me. <laughs> and I went, no. <laughs> so loud. They went, I think we're being listened to. I was like, that ruined that. But to bring this all the way back to your question. Um, so I, in terms of the different voices, I will, I, will, um, I, will, I have to put up charts. I have to make notes. I'll scribble in... in, in, in in uh, my notebook, and sometimes it's not even rhythm and cadence, although that's also important. I said, this person never says what he means. This person beats around the bush. This person is that friend who thinks they're blunt, but they're really tacky. Um, Y'all know that person. Um, you know, or sometimes also, but sometimes even that doesn't work, because when you get to character number 50, <laughs> you're like, okay, what do we do? And a lot of times, honestly, that just happens to be whichever, whichever book I'm reading at the time. Um, so there's a section in my book where I was reading Mrs. Dalloway, and thank God, um, because I couldn't figure out how to write a character who is internal and external at the same time, and she's wondering about her husband coming home, but these seagulls won't leave the damn fence and so on, and, and, I, was just, and I was reading uh, Mrs. Dalloway at the time, and it was fantastic. Um, there's another character, Weeper, who was never meant to have a voice. And when I got to him, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm all voiced out. Mm -hmm. And it's up and I was reading Margaret Duras's The North China Lover um, at the time. So those of you who don't know, Margaret Duras wrote this novel, The Lover, which became a very horrible film. She wrote a script for it. She will tell you it was, it was crap. And um, what she, she, because Margaret Duras is Margaret Duras, she looked at her notes for the screenplay and go, this is as good as any novel. I'll publish it. And she did, and she's right. It's actually better than the, than the lover. I, I, I mean, rarely see an author write and write the same book over. Um, and she did. But the thing about it is that it actually reads like stage direction. 
And I thought, Weeper is a, is a very violent, brutal guy, but he's also a very closeted homosexual. He would be obsessed with space. He'd be almost, he would stage manage a hookup. You know? He's going to be obsessed with how far away are people who can see me. Which made, you know, which when I was reading Duras, it makes sense because she wrote it almost like stage direction. And I figured he'd be stage managing even a hookup. And that's so it just kind of worked. I'm sure nobody reads it will think Margaret Duras. <laughs> but that's, that, you know, I mean, the, the way I write dialogue is to always keep my ears open. And the way I distinguish, I sometimes really have to sort of put things on the wall so I keep, so I keep track. Because you're right, the two, the p two biggest problem, challenges with dialogue is that they all sound like you or they all sound alike. And that to me is, is reading, um, particularly the masters of dialogue like Toni Morrison, um, certainly helped me. Thank you. Um, hello. Hi, how's um, it going? It's good. Um, in writing class, we mm -hmm. read an, uh, an excerpt from Annie Dillard mm -hmm. about how when you, when you choose what you're writing about, you don't choose what you love best, but you choose what you personally, instead of what others love, you choose what you personally love. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know what exactly was that that trademark that you think as a writer that you have? And then my second question, the follow-up question. Oh, because that one sorry. wasn't hard at all. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but when you're writing and the, when you decide the subject and also the plot, do you mm -hmm. ever find that what you're writing is insignificant to impacting the human experience or in the greater? <laughs> all right, we're going to answer the, the second question first, okay. mostly because I kind of... I think though, I think when you're writing, you I think particularly when you're writing a first draft, I think you have to be very sort of, for want of a better word, narrow in what you're doing, and you have to trust the you have, I, I, a few things. One, you have to trust your subconscious to be a better writer than you are. You have to sort of feel your way into the work because if you start to think of the significance of the work before you have even figured it out. You may, you may actually come across the, come with the wrong significance. Because sometimes writing the work is what leads you to what it will mean. And, um, and there is, the only worry I have about thinking about too much of what it might mean before you start writing is that the discovery that happens when you're writing might not happen. Um, it's, 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 and, it's, it's just, and this even happens when you're writing nonfiction, even when you're writing about your own life that there's still things to discover. So I, I stay open-ended and I don't think of those questions. I also think to an extent, a lot of those questions are, are, would be answered by, my, by lit students, and then I just take credit for it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I really love how you maintain that theme of loneliness through the first 50 pages. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know? I think, um, I think you also have to trust that as a writer in the world who's paying attention to the world, those views will come through. But it will come through. But it, but you have to trust. The, you have to trust the story. It has to flow in a way in which that feels good to the story. Let's go back to the first question, which I've totally forgotten. Oh, it's about. Uh, I asked what you personally love, based mm -hmm. instead of because authors all have their individual thing that they are. Mm. Um, Enraptured by, or yeah. find interesting. So what that's interesting. I, um, I haven't read Annie in, in a while. I actually taught, and I taught Pilgrim at, Pilgrim at Tinder Creek last year. Um, I actually, I don't know if I write from the stuff I love. I write from stuff I'm deeply conflicted about. Um, you know, things that I can't figure out, like uh, yeah, like loneliness. Or, or, you know, or disappointment. Like, I, I think when I'm writing, because I'm writing fiction, you have to allow characters to surprise or disappoint you. And those are the things I, I you know, I, I worry about. I always tell my students, yes, write what you love, write what you hate, but more than anything, write what you're deeply ambivalent about. Because that's where, the, particularly if you're writing nonfiction, but in fiction too. Because I think that's where the, 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 um, the, you know, the story is going to come from. Um, in terms of, I think, um, what I love, I love music and I love rhythm. And I love, I love that m when my stories feel as if they can be read aloud. And I love, I love volume. So, and I like, I like, I like, somebody gave me the best compliment a couple of days ago. He said, I smell your book. <laughs> 
I was like, that's the nicest thing anybody has ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's what I love. I love when, when the, in reading it, people feel as if a world came alive. I like that. I like smell. I like funk. Not the, the music as well, but I like, <laughs> I like that sort of sensory stamp left on, on, on writing. Y'all better not come with questions this difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm hoping this will be a little easier. Um, you talked a lot about the uh, the research that you did mm -hmm. uh, leading up to this book. I'm wondering if you like like what you came across that you really loved during mm -hmm. the research, and if you can talk about like any specific myths oh, yeah. that inspired you. Well, I mean, before we even talk about myths, one of the things I came across that I absolutely love was all these sort of ancient, medieval, not far away attitudes to queerness, and that was revelatory. Um, because, like everybody else, I drink the Kool-Aid about what's going on in, in Uganda and Nigeria, um, and about the homophobia and blah, 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 and, people, and, 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 and the sort of revisionist thinking, which is just basically African hotepism. Um, no, I'm not going to explain what a hotep is. <laughs> but, so things I discovered, um, for example, shoga, which some people use as a pejorative now, but there was a time when uh, these men, mostly warriors, were the only people trusted with wives to be because everybody knew they were gay. It's like, I trust you with my virgin daughter because everybody knows nothing is going to happen. <laughs> um, and, but it shows a, a, a freeness, a cavalierness, an acceptance, and even a sort of we are beyond it kind of thing that I thought was, was really, really powerful. And they weren't the only culture of queerness and queer unions and, and queer marriage and non-binariness. There's some tribes where there are 14 genders. Um, you know, it's great that y'all discover plural pronouns. Africa was doing that 4,000 years ago. <laughs> I'm glad y'all caught up. Um, but just the, the, and for me as a queer person, that was really affirming. That was really, it, it, I felt like something missing finally got found. And, uh, and it certainly gave me the leeway to explore queerness in this book. Um, and people think I was trying to score modern intersectionality points. I was like, actually, that's the oldest, most retro part of the book. Um, and that was, that was really, really delightful. Um, one of the things that I loved in reading the ancient African epics, quite a few of them, how much I had to let go of my very Calvinist sense of morality. One of the really, really cool ones is about this really badass cannibal witch. And she's only outsmarted by one person, her own daughter. And then she decides, you know what? I've had a full life. I'll go die now. <laughs> you know? No comeuppance, no nothing, because I'm a badass and I eat people. Yeah, I'm going to die now. So what? <laughs> and it was just, it was just sort of, um, it, was, it, was, it was such a uh, fun and rollicking and dangerous and, 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 and beautiful world. And I felt so sort of affirmed and so thrilled, but also kind of sad that I had to do research to find it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that we all are gonna have to work on and fix. But thank you. Cool. No, yeah. thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two questions. The mm -hmm. first one um, is a bit of a lighter one, just or not. There's a heavier one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to catch up. No, the, mm -hmm. the first question I thought was really interesting. I, I saw um, a press release today that um, Michael B. Jordan is going to be doing the adaptation mm -hmm. of the book. Thank um, you. And I think that was something that you mentioned you're quite keen on and having mm -hmm. this become this you know, all-encompassing world and becomes part of the, the mainstream. And it was quite interesting because, of course, Michael B. Jordan got in trouble for saying that we don't have African mythology mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So I think it's quite interesting that then he would sort of maybe as sort of, I don't know, trying to compensate, whatever it is, but it's mm -hmm. really great that he's, <laughs> <laughs> that, that he's doing this. Um, mm -hmm. But one thing that really struck me was in reading some of the press, um, the way in which, so seeing sort of his erasure of African mythology and then sort of seeing how this is not something that you control, but I think mm -hmm. um, how it's been made to seem as if this is the most, the, the sort of singular mm -hmm. African game of mm -hmm, Thrones, mm -hmm. right? So that the, there, there's the erasure of the, the years and the decades and the centuries mm -hmm. of work of African mythology. So I'm interested mm -hmm. sort of in how you are thinking about that mm -hmm. and this becomes the the yeah. sort of the danger of the single story with this is now the story, singular, just, yeah. People just won't let that go. Yeah. Um, 
You know, and, and you know, I, people, I, I, I stress all the time, people, I'm not doing something new. Um, before we even go further, that I am drawing from rich traditions, because I think sometimes that's also, it's not the problem, but they keep, they keep fanning that into proto. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, the rich traditions. I'm like, dude, Sylvia Samatar has been writing these things for years. If we want to go further back, we can look at Flora Nwapa, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Kaya Shante Wilson. Um, before we even get to Nenedi Okorafor and N.K. Jemison, that um, it's not like th this is a rich world that um, the, 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 you know, that people have already been writing in. I think there is, a, there is still a problem we have when they hear that there must always be one. And if there are two, the two are set against each other immediately. Um, in all levels, it's, it's amazing hearing how it was media that turned, this, is, this may seem sim a simple point, but it's actually pretty profound, that it was the media that turned Tara Banks and Naomi Will Campbell against each other. Because yeah. I think sometimes we bind to that. And I've run into, and I've actually had to deal that with authors mm -hmm. who come in with that kind of jealousy. I'm like, it, it, it doesn't have to be only one, you know? <laughs> Neither of us can contain the continent. And what a ridiculous idea to try. Um, most of the myths and legends I read and pulled from were merely coming from just a narrow strip in the center, from below Ethiopia to Ke Upper Kenya, going straight across. So I haven't even scratched the surface of South. And I knew the one thing I knew is I did not want to go above the Sahara. Um, but one thing I know I do is to constantly push against it. Every time, how does it feel to blah, blah, blah? I said, no, nah, I didn't do that. Uh, how does it feel to be in a place, something that isn't always done? It's not new. Mm -hmm. Here is a list of the people, and I will read them off. Here are the list of people that um, you can read. I think that's something that has to be constantly done. Mm -hmm. and Because we need people to get over the idea that there should be only a single story. Yeah. But, I, I, but, you know, my back broad, I have no problem re re saying this tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. Because it has to be done, and I think um, that... Um, I wouldn't be here without generosity of other writers and other people. So I have, you know, if that's, if that's one of the things I do, I would gladly do it. Y'all should pick up Sophia Samatar. She will rule your world. <laughs> and Kaya Shanti Wilson. Yeah. Oh, the second question. The second question. Um, sorry, this, the second question was just, again, struck by how your, your intro to this. So in a lot of the promoing to the book, it's the African Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. and as you talk now, you spend a lot of time sort of doing the clearing ground, mm -hmm. speaking to what has been done in the Western tradition, and this is what you're doing, and almost having to do that kind of justification for what mm -hmm. you're doing. Do you think that by the time you're getting to the second or maybe the third um, leg of the, the trilogy, you won't have to do that. You can kind of just do what you do God, without I having to. Well, I'm going to do it anyway, but I, I, you know, people like their shorthand. And to be fair, I'm the person who caused it. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I, I have to take some of, of the blame. But I think as the, the other novels progress and as they move, and they, and, and they move in, in very, very radically different directions, because it's very radically different people telling the stories, that I think um, hopefully it'll move beyond that. Or, or just stop. But I mean, I mean you know, I'm not going to fight it too much because there are things about it that I can also, I mean, I certainly have an admiration for George. Um, but again, it's, it's the single storying thing. And, and I think it's too much of, a, it's too much of an easy mm -hmm. um, you know, response. But you know, I mean, writers, I'm here to complicate things. So I'll keep doing it. Thank you. Um, I was wondering not everything can make it into a book. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite idea that you came up with that ultimately you had to cut? Oh my God. I'm trying to think about it because usually I would say, okay, this can go in the next book. That's probably a better question for when I finish all, when I finish all three. Things that, I'll tell you what, what um, did make it in the book is um, uh, there are long, long stretches of song and they had to pry it from my cold, dead hands. <laughs> uh, I mean, because I, one, I love the epics, and I particularly love the musical ones. Um, that, I think, that didn't make it, and I think I'm probably going to sneak it back in um, somewhere, because it's, you know, I love verse, and particularly um, African Oriki verse, which is wonderful. A lot of these ancient epics have been translated, but they've been translated by scientists, which is great but it probably is waiting to be translated by a poet. 
So I'm serving notice to the African poets. <laughs> but that's, that's the only thing I can think of so far. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. Last question, better make it good. <laughs> oh, yikes, okay. Um, I was wondering, since you draw on like a lot of things that were originally like oral traditions, mm -hmm. how, does, how do you deal with that or how do you think of that when you're writing things that your reader hears in their head and they don't sort of get that sound? Mm -hmm. you, th I, you think oh. about that or is it just something you toss off? No, I think about it all the time. That's what I think about more than anything else. Um, it has to be able to sound right. Um, I write, even in the previous book, but particularly this one, I wrote it to be read aloud. Um, not that you have to read it aloud, but I read it aloud, and I am very interested in the orality of, of, of sentences. Um, I am very interested in volume. I'm very interested in pitch and tone. I'm interested in this thing called energy. Like one of the exercises I give my students, I said this really, really quick because we need to move on. I have them look at their words and assign them a, an energy value. Like five for the most vibrant, sensory, blah, 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 and one for the least. So I'd go, stab, how much is that? They go, oh, it's a four. I'll go, um, you know, something like, I don't know, whisper. They go, oh, that's like a three. I say, no, it's more like a four. It, it, it shrinks space. Well, shout. They go, shout's a four. I go, okay, what's well, manage? <laughs> how about obtain? You know, how about commodify? <laughs> so you have a story and your, st your story ends with she managed to free herself. It's perfectly fine. It's just dull as a doorknob. Um, so <laughs> what I'm getting to is even the energy of things. So yeah, the, the, how it sounds aloud is very important for me. to me. If for no other reason, most of the epics I read, they're not just the African ones. If you read, you know, the Iliad is made to be, to her, to be heard. So that was very important to me. And that's why I paid attention to like pitch and rhythm and volume. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that's it from. That's all we have time for tonight. Thank all you right. everyone for coming. Thank you guys for having me.